Can you share your screen? So, Adam, Adam Sigi, a -B -B, a -B -B, is a DPhil student in the Department of Education, University, University of Oxford. His research, His research focuses on the, on the role of education in ethnic conflicts and peace building in Ethiopia. In Ethiopia. Particularly notions of hopelessness and historical, and historical narrative. Prior to, to attending Oxford, Adam graduated, Adam graduated from the University of Pennsylvania with a, with a bachelor's in public health and master's, and master's in profit, profit leadership. leadership. At Oxford, he tutors Hebraic. Comparative, comparative education, education while, also while also exploring the university at their personal, personal project, including, including eating at all the Oxford colleges so far. Attending, attending some of the masses of all Oxford churches and, and all, all college, college or even or songs. Even songs. As well as, as, as wearing Chinese college. college. These, these he manages using the generous, using the generous stipend of the Rhodes, of the Rhodes Scholarship, scholarship for, which for which he was selected, he was selected on one, one of the two, of the two inaugural global, global Rhodes scholars. scholars. Welcome, welcome, Adam, Adam, and very much, very looking, much looking forward to your um, talk. Um, talk. Thank you. Can you see me? Yes. And can you hear me? Yes. OK. Um, thank you for attending, everybody. And um, please do be generous with me as uh, I just signed up for this. Um, but hopefully it will be a very fruitful conversation. Um, could you feed it, perhaps? <coughs> OK, um, so my presentation will focus on uh, education and ethnic conflicts, which is like the subject of my PhD research as well. Uh, and for, for the theme of this seminar, I would focus mostly on uh, related to flourishing or barriers to flourishing. Um, so let's uh, let's get started with this. So uh, I looked into the seminar and some of the central questions that are discussed for uh, for this are how then might education support pathways to human flourishing in different contexts and especially in uncertain contexts and what are the purposes of education in, prom in promoting becoming and flourishing so i will relate this to peace building education or conflicts in the context of ethiopia that i am studying because um the first thing is for me like how do we how do i define before i start from education, how do I define flourishing? What does flourishing mean? And this, why I chose peace is the central concept for me that the goal for education, one of the goals at least for education should be to attain peace. And this idea that, you know, through education that you, we can have a society in which actually we will lessen the violence and eventually, of course, the individual will be fully capable to attain their own potentials. Um, so I wanted I wanted to study about peace or peace building and like in the central aspect of um, the UNESCO con um, the UNESCO Constitution as well as as you can see since wars like it's written in the UNESCO Constitution since wars began begin in the minds of men it is in the minds of men that the defense of peace must be constructed and this is written in the UNESCO Constitution so which means that there is a lot of hope and expectation that we put in education that actually it will be used as a support or as a pathway for flourishing. However, unfortunately for me, at least so, even though I was interested to study about peace building, the empirical data for which I was interested to study in the context of Ethiopia didn't support it. Didn't, I didn't necessarily find pathways to flourishing. So then I needed to shift more to barriers for flourishing. And this is important as well, actually, because I, uh, I don't know if uh, you can see very clearly about the two 
frameworks that I'm using, and one of it is by David Johnson, our convener for the seminar. Um, it's, it focuses on at the bottom of the pathways to human flourishing. We have to go through fundamentally three or four steps before we talk about the central person or the individual being equipped to flourishing. There is at the outer there is the intern the international and the national context enabling and disabling factors, and then at at the at the middle way there is the community and the society, and that those factors have to be enabled for the person to find the the pathways to flourishing, and then at the third level there is the home and the school, and for my context, that uh, I was interested to study about peace building, especially. I wanted to talk about how does one attain peace, and for that, there are several layers that one has to understand for peace. And again, I, I, I present the second framework to see how complex and or how ambitious it is to actually expect for education to contribute to the peace building process. And I'll give you a very central example. This is because we're talking about like, you know, peace between groups, between ethnic groups or between tribal groups or between nations. But I had to acknowledge first, before the nations come to peace or before actually groups come to peace, do you start from the individual where like, does the individual itself has to be at peace with their own, you know, emotional or like character level, which is again another Would be a low opportunity, I mean, a high opportunity cost. Uh, so, the grid ingredients 
society based, uh, the Britain grievance argument basically minimizes the argument for grievance in which people are actually, people don't have much of, you know, like legitimate grievances on history or something. It's more the greed that incentivizes them. And the second one is the horizontal inequality, which is again relevant for different ethnic groups between the horizontal inequality, right? This is relating to deprivation, the perceived understanding of the inequality between these two groups actually creates conflict. And education, especially, is one of the important ways in which inequality is perpetuated. So Stuart's um, discussion on this is instrumental, especially if we can have like if we can have two groups having equal access to education, it's better or for um, the society. And the third one is. Uh, how ethnic conflicts happen, which is the us versus them, on how we teach individuals between, you know, how they form identities. And especially there's a lot of literature on civics education or citizenship education and how we should teach history uh, education. And then the fourth one is, uh, which is less discussed within the education um, literature, is the Horowitz structural institution for Ethiopia, because the way this in which we have structured our society can actually separate our students physically, like at a literal level. And this is important, for example, in like, you know, Israel or in the US, if you think of educating you know, black and white people like, separately, then like, that's no good. We have a come to accept that that's no good for societies. But in countries where we have adopted federalism as a structure of governance, it inevitably puts students in schools in, schools in which the only people that they see is people of their own ethnic group. So the institutional governance or structural and uh, structuring of school itself can be important. And the last one is uh, other contextual um, factors, which is the youth budget was increasing like youth and unemployment and then higher education expansion where you know, the value of higher education itself becomes low. So, um, and I will further discuss about it. Um, so for the Ethiopian context, um, it's important to understand the Ethiopian context because Ethnic conflicts, if you see the uh, case studies, most of them come from historical uh, classic case studies where Israel, Rwanda against South Africa and stuff. But the Ethiopian case is different because one, education access has actually has increased. So Polly's argument in which you know, the grid and gradients wouldn't work because with millennium development goals, it has increased. And then regional inequality is becoming less and less because federalism meant that each regions were responsible for their own educational uh, provinces, so the inequality between the groups cannot be necessarily attributed to that. And then the third part, the us versus them, which is how we teach history, education and stuff, becomes relevant. But in Ethiopia's case, there are so, like, it's more than 80 ethnic groups. Um, and there isn't necessarily two groups that are, that you can pinpoint us versus them. Uh, so the role of education can be more ambiguous than positive or negative. Um, so let me talk a little bit then about the Ethiopian context, where uh, like it gives us the foundational understanding of how education might contribute. The first thing I will discuss uh, later on as well is um, education has, in the context of Ethiopia, education has expanded and has been widely celebrated and studied by Oxford, Cambridge, several other, the Young Lives Project here in Oxford, the RISE program, several others for its high education enrollment and um, Given universal education, so education has expanded, uh, but its citizenship and nation building or its uh, education role in it has been incredibly contested, but has not been able to to be studied. The the, the question on like, citizenship and nation building because of the past governments in which, like um, again, like it's widely accepted that so, so it might be my opinion. For the past 28 years, since 1991, has been a more um, dictatorial government in which. There hasn't been a space for the research to be conducted on these kinds of topics. So, and then uh, the case study has been more interesting, especially because of um, the civil war that has been happening in the country since the past, uh, since 2020, and um, even more interesting because our prime minister has been selected as the Nobel Peace Prize, Peace Prize work, but we are still in this conundrum of conflict. So then, where does the role of education lie in this conflict? Now, um, I'll, dis I'll discuss a little bit because um, I will discuss a little bit because I want to talk about the challenges in researching 
uh, educational pathways or barriers to flourishing, which will address the central topic of this seminar as well. First, education role, both positive and negative, is limited by the larger political and structural issues. And I acknowledge this because it's very difficult to say there is a role for education for flourishing or for conflicts, because when much of the conflict is led by way outside of the education institution, the conversation should be having with a lot broader audience than just within the education circle. So the education might play a role, but its role, again, is limited. And then much of the ethnicization of students' identities might be happening outside of schools. Um, I, I also say this because you know, if, I'm, if I want to study about education, how it might be creating barriers, but much of ethnicization or the barriers are happening outside of school, if students are being educated in social media or in the digital media or within their communities, then my study of education itself, as, list, as I labeled it, in the formal education or schooling becomes at least irrelevant. So then we have to ask, the again, what do we mean by that education? Or like in this seminar, where is our hope or expectation of that education is? Is it within the institution of the schooling? Or is it outside where you know the digital media is actually leading how people are educated about their identities or um, just general terms. So I acknowledge that the ethnicization might have also happened significantly outside, again, which is also supported by my data and the field work. And then the second part is in the context of very poor education systems like that of Ethiopia, which I'll discuss again, education's role must be studied as a whole system and as a composite, i.e. asking what is education for? So I can speak like two, three hours about like what are the barriers within the education system? like the pedagogy or the lack of quality of teachers or the curriculum or, you know, there's a funding or the rural areas. There are so many endless things that I can mention to you. But at the end, for me, it's like if it is all a composite of problems, then I must ask within this, this functional system, what does education mean for the Ethiopia's context? Why is the, the schooling system, first of all, there? What is its purpose? so I can have at least a holistic understanding in which education might be par participating in conflict. So, and then the, so if I say, what is education for in Ethiopia, first of all, before I say, how is it, how, how it is contributing to conflict, there's a significant challenge in defining the purpose of education itself. And I will, I will say this, I'm an education PhD student. I'm currently tutoring about, you know, on education. I wanted, I didn't have necessarily a bachelor or master's background. So maybe I asked some of like the students who had master's uh, stu uh, background and say, hey, can you refer me perhaps to this one fundamental book where if someone is starting to just say, what is education? You know, how do I understand this field as a field? Or what's its purpose? Can you point me to a book that I can actually start? I actually run to a lot of difficulty trying to pinpoint to this book or to this author where I can say this is the purpose of education. The kind of references that I have are most about learning, you know, Paulo Freire or this person or that person, where it's focused on learning. But education, as we know it, as, it's, as an institution of formal schooling, its purpose for me hasn't necessarily been defined, or at least, you know, it's very hard to articulate when I spoke to policymakers or others. So um, in my attempt to at least come with, like, you know, about like to understand the barriers of education. I tried to use uh, Biesta's three purposes of education as a framework. Um, sorry, let me. Yeah. Um, so I wanted to use Biesta's three purposes of education, or at least schooling, as a framework to say, okay, at least for this uh, conversation, this is what I'm using. For schooling, basically, Biesta describes it as like, you know, three, three purposes, qualification, socialization, subjectification. And I say the three purposes to say that education might contribute to conflict when it fills this broader purposes. And especially in, in Ethiopia, we use the, uh, when I talk to teachers and students, they use this term called bukuyal honen. Or like we made a generation that is inadequate, be it by way of skills, be it by way of thinking, or be it by way of trying to align or collaborate or 
sympathize with the other person. So we're, for these three purposes, basically the qualification aspect of the schooling, which is why we get examined, which is why we pass from degree to this, to this, to that, that is like the number one, at least I have observed within the schooling system. And then the, third, the second part is the socialization in which we, the state at least wants to use the schooling system to kind of normalize and standardize what must be taught about, you know, like what the national identity means or what it means to be, you know, this and this and that. And then there is a tension between that socialization, but you must also have that subjectification or the critical thinking of the individual empowerment. So these are the general broad three purposes that I think could articulate the current schooling system. And basically, I, I feel like much of the other conversation could perhaps fit within this. Um, so for, for the Ethiopia's context, I say, when these three purposes are not necessarily fulfilled, then there might be barriers for flourishing. And I say might be because, again, like I said, the factors are incredibly significantly larger than in the education system itself. So within qualification, I say with the Ethiopia's, the Ethiopia's education system from my study has created certified but not qualified use. And how is it certified? Because there has been incredible amount of progress for the expansion of education. In fact, even more for higher education. Um, okay, yes. But this youth are coming out with, without, um, without the feeling that they're adequately been able to create prospects for their own future lives, to be able to attain their uh, aspirations and jobs. And I will talk about like two things that will come uh, that, um, that my main theme of my findings are hopelessness or shattered hopes, less of hopelessness. People had hope within the education system. They thought they would be somewhere, but they were not attained. The, 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 un, the unmet expectation between their aspirations and their reality is one big thing. And so they, they basically didn't feel qualified. And the second one is what I will discuss later, which is the lack of common identity or the, the, the inability to, to build national identity. So for the first one within the qualification, uh, I start with the teachers and I can give you, uh, if I have, yeah, I do have time. I can give you some quotes so you can have, you can hear it from the teachers themselves. So. Okay. Um, so the first one is like the um, MDGs and evaluations that I say, one of the big problems that came during my study where teachers are very much critical or they saw it as a barrier to actually, you know, making certified but not qualified students, which is during the MDGs, there has been incredible amount of emphasis on expansion of education and the government was interested in this because that was the only way they could access donor money and they were also targeted and evaluated in this. But that expansion came at the cost of teachers' profession and students also not getting the right amount of education that they should have gotten. And I give you one, for example, uh, one quote where in which teachers are explaining how they are evaluated for not what they taught, but how many students they passed from one stage to the other. Because the only thing that counted was higher enrollment at every grade level. So I'll, t uh, I'll give you a teacher's quote. It's not mandatory. Uh, it's not a problem that school was mandatory, but the sole responsibility was burdened on teachers. The teacher was made to leave his classroom and scout around to get children to attend schools. Campaigning should have been the role of the party members, not the teacher who should be in class teaching. Maybe he could go to church or mosque and preach the value of education, but the teacher was made a scout, be chased by dogs in the farms and get bitten just to get children to attend schools. Even the principal was sent as a scout. The system made our profession below the status of beggars. In fact, less than a beggar. Not only your time, but you are stripped, stripped of your dignity because the teacher will be fired from his job if he does not get the enrollments and attendance in school. And um, I, I'm obviously, I'm, as a researcher, I'm inspired by these powerful quotes. But I'll tell you, these are not like very unique things from one or two teachers that I have found. The, the profession of the teacher has been actually degraded quite low because it was the responsibility of the teacher to go in these rural areas and actually make sure there was this enrollment, just the ticking of the enrollment itself. 
So the teachers have been demoralized and felt they are out of the things. One, again, because of this emphasis on the MDG goals. And then the second one is the surveillance and political oppression in which student teachers didn't feel actually they could, I asked them, okay, did you, did you say no to the, to the school administrator or did you say no to the uh, local bureaucrats? And they said, no, I can't because the system didn't allow it. And I'll, I'll tell you this, the external pressure that comes, uh, this is a quote, the external pressure that comes from outside school wasn't easy. The district, the district officials will just tell you they need to speak with this teacher and you're asked to have a surveillance on the work of the teacher. If you are a balanced principal, you say it's not your role to surveil the teacher. You can say that as a fellow party member, but by telling your truths and not supporting the party with your lies, you will forever be stuck with your principal role and you will not grow in your career. And you try to find as much, you try to defend as much as you can, but you must do it wisely if you want to stay alive because you will see people who got killed for opposing. So to survive and protect your family, you choose to become blind and deaf instead of trying and teaching the students. Um, and I only mention this too, because I mean, above this, there's the well-being of the teacher, the pedagogy, and all the other things that I didn't mention. But these are two powerful, unique things that are very unique for the Ethiopia's context. So this is one demoralized and helpless teachers. Um, and then we have not only helplessness and demoralization among teachers, and then you will also see it in the students, like this shattered hope or broken hope in students where they lost value in education. Like, wh why should I go to school or why should I um, become educated? The number one thing has become, again, I, expect, I explained in the larger contextual factors, this growing youth population where they are educated, they have higher aspiration, but that is not met by the economy. So then the unemployment and corruption becomes a significant factor in which people feel there is no value in education. So I say this in Ethiopia, like this is a quote from the student, in Ethiopia, the poorest ones are the educated ones. We see a farmer having better reach of his agriculture or others by taking shortcuts, stealing. There is no profit in the long walk, but the shortcuts. Education is no use here. We see it in our, home, in our own homes where much of the students I spoke, and this I also have personal experience with my own friends and brothers and stuff, where you know, there's an incredible amount of unemployment. This is after students have gotten into university, they have graduated with first degree and they still at home. So then how do you make that case for the rest of the other children to continue to go to school? And then the second part is the, the forged papers. So which is the devalued credibility of educational qualification. And this is a very interesting phenomenon where in Ethiopia, where you go and the government itself admitted that more than 50% of its own bureaucrats have their thing is fake. So to, to be employed within the government structure, you need to have a degree, but then because of nepotism and stuff, you can have your own degree qualification where you don't have to, you know, basically you don't have to go to school to attend those materials or those education qualifications and that has created high level of you know like lost like sorry, lost of loss of trust in the system where basically you don't need to go to school if you can actually have like you know, that grade and uh, surprisingly what was surprising for me was when i spoke to university teacher university students they in fact defended it and they said well, have a forged a forged paper i said why, why should you have it they said look if the person who claims to be educated himself doesn't have a skill, the so-called educated people don't have the skills required, but the government requires you to have this educational paper to uh, gain those jobs, or if the jobs are highly tied to the educational paper and the educated person himself doesn't have the skills needed, what's the problem if you fake it? Because you both don't have skills anyway. In fact, you might have the skills by way of experience. Um, so you may have many years of work experience and you may know the job more than the so-called educated one, but you will not be hired if you don't have the degree paper. Therefore, to get the job, you must get the forged one. So this is the way in which even the students themselves who are at you know, university, who feel like they're not getting the, the skills that they should be getting are defending how can, one can have a forged paper. Um, so this then, for me, it created a dilemma. Okay, if you don't think you are learning in school, you know, if you don't think it's valueless, why are you in school? I asked the student, why are you here? 
if you don't think like you're better off without. And uh, it seemed very big to me, but then it was easily explained by my aunt, actually. Um, you know, I said, why is she here if she is not going to school to learn or something? She said, Gizela Mokhtar. It basically means to count time, meaning that if school has become where you go because there's nowhere else to go. If the family itself doesn't have money to actually make the student go and get something, then in it's a public education, that's where they should spend time. So basically it becomes a way in which you just pass through life because that's the way you can only be. And then the second one is many students, many students said, or to get a driver license. In Ethiopia, to get a driver license, you must have finished grade 12. Like you need to finish grade 12 and have your grade 12 or your high school certification to get a driver license. So then you have like, you know, students who don't want to be there, but they're there because they need that to show and get the driver license and become a driver because that's a stable job. So you can imagine that kind of atmosphere it creates in schools where students don't want to be there, but they're there. The teachers don't want to be there, but they're there. Where it has created, basically it creates an environment where it becomes itself a barrier for um, flourishing. Then the second part is socialization, which is the making of ethnicized or um, I said non-virtuous human beings, especially I focus on this lack of common identity in within the Ethiopian one. Um, so I mentioned two things in the, how do you create, teach virtue and character? The responsibility of virtue and character has been solely kind of relied on Ethiopia for the civics education. Um, but civics education, anyone will tell you, you go there, it's quite undermined. No one cares about it because they tell you, look, our government and stuff, they have been here 30 years. How can we talk about democracy in, in the class when, when it is like this? Um, and then there's incredible um, high amount of censorship within the teachers and the students on what they can teach and what they cannot. So I'll give you again an examples for this, uh, which is, so I ask for a student, you know, like, look, you can get something out of school and she, this is the, re, uh, this is what she replied to me, like, you know, why she doesn't think like there's an absolute value of learning and learning. She said, for knowledge, I could get a lot more from my phone online. Why waste my time in school, even on TikTok? So if I want to learn, I can do online. When what you are learning in school is meaningless, it's only talks, nothing in practice. And I asked her, give me an example. She said, no need for examples. They teach us not to do corruption, but that's the first thing you see in school. The civic teacher will give you grades if you give him money. And similarly, a teacher also explains to me why they cannot discuss more than what the curriculum says within the class, saying you can't teach in depth in civics classes. That's why civics courses was being taught by party members, but who had graduated with physics and math subjects. They don't know the pedagogical science of the subject. These are hard natural science students who don't know the social science field. To start with, they are only there, not because they wanted to be teachers, because they want to move up through, they want to move up through the party organization system. They were teaching civics because they were not yet, they were not yet adequate for other political roles or they were demoted from other offices due to behavioral problems. And um, this is also supported by the Human Rights, um, uh, Human Rights Watch like report in 2018 where it was found, you know, like more than 90% of the civics teachers are required to be party members. And I don't know how to explain, basically party members is you have to be affiliated for the political, with the leading political party for you to be employed. And this is an aspect of many bureaucracies, including schools. So this like, so there hasn't been where in which, you know, students are taught morals and ethics. So it's considered, you know, civics education, but it has a lot to do with uh, the government's own curriculum. And then the second part is uh, there hasn't been a common national identity. And this goes way beyond education, but I'll give you a, a, a first example. When I went to school, I went to school with only people from my own ethnic group. And that's continued. This continued for majority of Ethiopians because you go to school in your own ethnic region until you go to universities. And universities are the first places where they meet other ethnic groups who speak differently, who hold different views, historical views or kind of places. So then, you know, think of again, it's like the segregate, I mean, the, the level of segregation, not by choice, but because of the structure we have adopted, which is ethnic federalism. 
Um, and then the second part is the 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 mandate for uh, designing history curriculum, especially for primary and second for primary level, is um, for regional governments and regional governments design their own history curriculum, which has been contested. And then the, second, the third part is uh, the no common language of instruction. This also I will mention here that the case of Ethiopia is a very unique st case study because because it has not been colonized. Uh, the language issue and the history issue is very much critical because you can't use, for example, a common colonial language in which other African countries have adopted, where you can use English or French, or you can't use like you know certain historical narratives where you can kind of basically create a national identity against colonialism. So that has been a very common uh, challenge for um, creating a common identity within Ethiopia. So I'll go forward for time purposes. Um, the third part is the subjectification part, which is, um, so now we have students who have been taught within their own ethnic groups and they have their own you know, beliefs on certain things. There hasn't been a significant focus on civics education or morals and virtues. Um, and then on top of that, there is the problem of the critical thinking, uh, sorry, the subjectification or the problem of the critical thinking. Um, so for this, I will mention two things which is the first one is uh, the for critical, th critical thinking, again, similar to the qualification where critical thinking couldn't happen because um, you know, a teacher is saying like, you know, I have to deal with a lot of like, you know, students at one time. And more than that, the, the misplaced policies that was adopted by MDGs, which two of them are self-contained classrooms and automatic promotions. And I'll explain them. The self-contained classrooms are where a teacher is responsible for teaching all four subjects like maths, English, social science, and natural science throughout grade one, grade two, grade three, grade four, like from first to four, it follows them. Now, I have seen this perhaps in my experience in the US where like in you know, one teacher, because it's not significant, but in Ethiopia's case, this becomes extremely dangerous because I will explain who these teachers are, how these teachers are recruited. If a teacher, if one teacher is the one that's following all the students and they don't necessarily feel equipped in all those four subjects, the foundation of these children at the very basic level is what's, you know, what becomes dangerous. Um, and then the, the second part is the exam centered um, curriculum because we follow a very high stake examination at grade 10 level and at grade 12 level. Um, so for automatic promotion, uh, like that, that is like what I told what I mentioned earlier in which a teacher is a teacher is mandated to automatically promote the students, even if they don't have like you know the required grades. Now I'll give you a quote on this. When the teachers evaluate and pass only the deserved students, you are told after time is spent, human resources is spent, money is spent. Why do you feel this money students? You are told to improve yourself because if the student fails, you are the one who failed. You are told to pass the student, even when the student attended classes only for a day or two per year. You automatically make them pass. The students didn't even know how to spell their names, but passed to grade seven and eight. And now, now at your high school, your 40 minutes class is wasted helping those students catch up and leaving out the other good ones. The government needed the enrollment numbers to get the MDG aid money. For you, the teacher and your consciousness, you can eat mud, they wouldn't care. Um, so then if you have like, you know, this kinds of policies in which the teachers are here, then I asked myself, who are these teachers, which was very important. The policy in which, like, you know, when this Millennium Development Goals were um, adopted, there were a high number of students, but few number of teachers. So the, the teacher shortage became a real problem. So the choice they adopted to actually increase high number of teachers where they allowed people to get trained one year training after they failed, like the grade 12, like to pass to upper secondary level. So when you finish grade 12 and if you fail, you, can, you are allowed to go into either become a health officer, a field agricultural uh, supporter, or you become a teacher. These are the three key, you know, important things for Ethiopia's life, like the agriculture, the farmer, the health, the farmer, and then the teacher. But this, you know, like this value, these things are so devalued that, you know, like it's the great 10 dropouts. Or like, you know, when you fail to go into um, university that you become in here. And then the classic one is assigned by not, not by choice. I have spoken to 
from teachers to university level professors, more than 50, 60 of them, not one of them told me they choose to become a teacher or they choose to become uh, into this profession. You are assigned, which is like the, what, what happens after the grade 12 or like university entrance examination, you put 12 of your list. No one chooses to become into a teacher or education. You was assigned your like fifth and sixth choice, some of them not by choice. So not one chose to become a teacher. And then even the rest of them who became later on is after they didn't find jobs. Um, and then the last one is, um, I will go forward a little bit, is the incompetent and political education management, which is the governance from the council level to literally Ministry of Education, which whom I know. It's literally by political loyalty. No one has a technical education background. And then the second one is like, so this is not led by teachers, uh, but by, you know, your political loyalty is sought after. Um, and then the, the, the second one, because we haven't had any like good political leadership with really good educational background, much of our education policy has been led by donor focused money than with an Ethiopian context. And I finish with that because that's what I feel is missing with the, the, what is the philosophy of Ethiopian education or like what is what is it meant to do fundamentally? Is it when it is like, you know, 70 percent agricultural society? Is there a point to actually like design our schooling system the same way industrial society? So the same way, you know, um, much of the Western society has been designed. And when this Millennium Development Goal comes for universal education, you know, we never ask or we never had the chance to ask, what's the point like, you know, of educating everyone all at the same time if no one can come out of it with a potential to flourish? Um, so this is a very uh, difficult one. So I leave you with this. The content is very difficult. So this is a teacher that um, a quote that he told me, sorry. The content is very difficult, overloaded, and little class time is given. Then the time is wasted working between this class and another. And look at this method. It's chalk and talk that kills your time. And the leftover time is then left trying to manage 60 and that many students in one class. Above that, when you see what's inside the students, there's no hope. Why? There are two or three students who graduated from their household but are unemployed. That impacts them and they say they can't grow, they can't go anywhere with their education. But they but then they see others who stop education having shortcuts, so they just want to finish and use paper to get their driver's license. They tell you, teacher, I just wanted for budget driving, just add one more grade for me. Up to that level of hopelessness, they are presented to you in your classroom. You just work hard for the very rare and few students who are motivated to learn. You have consciousness and it's your profession. So for the sake of one or two students, you try your best. Otherwise, the majority will break you. They are not even ready to write simple notes you give them. You don't know what their vision and goals are. So um, I finish with this and I, I, I say, um, obviously many of you in this uh, seminar um, have been aware with like the ongoing conflict in Ethiopia. What's unfortunate sometimes is the way it has been understood is it's a very classic kind of why do African ethnic groups fight a very tribal understanding or primordial understanding where it's, you know, like they don't like each other, they don't understand each other. But I, I, I say, you know, when someone doesn't, you know, like someone said to me, if you don't have hope, you know, if you, if you have nothing to lose, you can do anything. So much of the education, like participation in this is less to do with this, this hate, you know, this person learned to hate the other person, but more to do with it didn't give them the means in which to achieve their potential. It means to, to flourish and actually like do what they want. But education has sold us like so much dreams and aspirations in which, you know, you're told anyone, you know, you can be a doctor. What do you want to be? You can be engineer, you can be pilot. Like many other people in different corners, most Ethiopians or my friends at least grew up with these dreams, but not the means to um, accomplish them. So. Unfortunately, yes, I'm leaving you with a little bit of sad story, uh, but that is the reality. I wish to leave you with hopeful ones, but this is, I feel this is where to start because the barriers are more prominent at the moment, at least in my case study, than uh, the pathways to flourish. Thank you very much.
Well, well thank you, Adam. That was a really sad landscaping is rather desolate. Um, so I'm really, um, really looking forward to our questions. Um, I hope you can hear me on the um, chat in the in Microsoft Teams. Um, I, if you can please, on the top row, there is a hand, a signal. So if you're on Microsoft Teams, please you put up your hands if you have a question. And um, if you're in here in the lecture theatre, I might, since there's a few of us, perhaps I might ask you to come up here and share my, come on here and, and come on screen, just because we don't have a roving camera at the moment. But I'd really um, like to open the floor to everyone. And thank you again for coming in, providing us with such a thought provoking and important um, paper. David. Oh, okay. Not, not oh. at the moment. Um, David's going to. You can turn on your speaker. I'll turn on mm -hmm. oh, Yes, oh, after, after Kurt, Kurt will come on. Would you like to ask a question? Would you like to, Lorna, would you like to uh, pass your computer? Um, you can to... speak here. It's muted at the moment. You go no, 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 you, you, you it's do. not okay. muted. But do you, uh, you yeah, yes, yes. <laughs> okay. Um, so do you want me to hold it? So, <laughs> hi, everyone. <laughs> I'm asking my question. Um, thank you, Adam, for um, for that. Um, it was, it was a very good, um, I, I really, I really enjoyed it, and it was a very, um, um, perfectly structured and surmised uh, view of, of the issue. I was um, I was particularly drawn to one. Uh, so it's it's a very basic question, I guess. But I was particularly drawn to your discussion of uh, qualification uh, as as one of the themes in in the circle. And I was wondering. So it seems that um, students. One of the reasons why students do stay in school is because they the driver's license is is an incentive for them to stay in school. And earlier, you also mentioned that teachers have to go and seek students to encourage them to join school. So I was wondering what you think of such incentives. Uh, would you, I mean, given that there is a lack of um, willing enrollment on behalf of the students, do you, do you, what do you think of such incentives? I, I can see that they have a negative impact in the sense that students just kind of don't really think about education, but they, they can just get forged documents and then just get the driver's license. But perhaps, I, I, I guess I wonder, because there could be such, such, such other incentives uh, in encouraging education. And I was wondering if you could speak about, speak to that really, perhaps not just the goods and the bads, but I guess, why, why do they fail you? Um, and, what what could be done for them to not fail? I guess. Okay. Yes. Hopefully, can you you can hear me? So uh, basically, the um, so the, the the driver license. So those students who want to be in the school are the urban students, and then the the teachers that they're chasing after are in the rural areas. So for the mismatch, but. So what, what what can you do for in terms of willing in enrollment or the incentivize? I mean, this is the big question or why do they feel this is the big question? But what I would say, um, sorry, what, what I would say is, so for example, some of the students tell me how they wish to, you know, they are at the level of grade 11 and 12. You know, they would much prefer to be in the vocational school instead of being in that one. So which is for the government. So now they have not allowed it to like take exams. So like you have to finish up to grade 12 before you go to vocational school. But for most of them who see, you know, like you are better off as a carpenter, especially in the previous times, it used to be stig significantly stigmatized. 
and hence why most students thought they're better off going into these universities and stuff. But now the university graduates are actually out of jobs and those who are carpenters are getting money. So they want to be in, so the willingness, for example, incentive for most of them, they want to be in the, you know, learning a trade. But one, like their parents don't allow them. And then two, you know, um, the government itself doesn't allow them. They need for much of like, you know, the different aspects, you know, to get any access to this thing. The grade 12 thing is that the certification leaving is a, very important. It's like your way to the keys. So they don't, so what would have been the good incentive to be there? It would have been a good education if they actually enjoyed it, if it was meaningful to them, if it was relevant to the Ethiopian context, that would have been a really great in incentive. But unfortunately, that's not the case. Thank you, Adam. Um, we've got a we've got a question from Kurt. Kurt, if you could unmute and ask to the group or to hear from you. Hello, this is Kurt Shaw. I'm in, I'm in Brazil. And so, it's, it's hard to thank it's you hard. for such, a, uh, uh, such despair that you provide. Nonetheless, the analysis was brilliant. And, um, and I will say thanks for that. But what it reminded me most of um, was uh, Vaclav Havel's analysis in the, the, um, of, of communism, where he said, and you talk about, a lot about the socialization role of education. And it strikes me that the real, uh, sorry, the subjectivization uh, role of education. And the, the real subject of subjectivization that's going on here is cynicism. That what you're trying to create is a series of cynical subjects where the most ambitious, the most interesting people who, are, who, who, who might do something are in fact deeply cynical. That they're not looking for meaning anymore. They're not looking for purpose. And that that functions very well uh, in a government which doesn't want challenges to itself. Um, but in fact, is perhaps the worst of the challenges to you in flourishing when you're constructing a, when you're subjectivizing a cynical subject, that's going to be really hard for any kind of flourishing to happen in the future. Um, I don't know if you've read Havel, but uh, the, the power of the powerless is, is, a, is a really tremendous lesson of how it is that he says, look, when, when uh, the Communist Party insists that you put a, a poster in your, in your business, they're not really wanting you to believe that. They just want to say, I can, and I, don't, I want to disconnect your belief from your action. And it strikes me that a lot of the things that you're talking about are really about that. They're just creating the cynical subject. Thank you, Kurt. Thank you, Kurt. Was it a comment? I can comment on that more. A dumber question. What, what I'd love to hear yeah. is if, if that's a correct analysis of what you're saying. If, if, we're, if we are talking about cynicism, or if you think that there is some something else that's going on. Um, maybe that's, uh, that, OK, sorry. Uh, you can hear me, right? So like, I would say the, the question of cynicism um, it certainly applies, like applies in this context that people feel like I wouldn't know if I would call it cyn they're cynical about, you know, like you know, their agency or, you know, what's happening. Or if I wouldn't know if I would call them rightly hopeless or like bro with broken hopes. Um, but to your point about like, you know, the government or at least what's happening at their levels to create this, that, you know, that would need, you know, a really big evidence for me to say that like, you know, the government intentionally created cynical people. But that might have been the result of like, you know, like what has happened. But at the level of the students, what I can say is instead of being cynical or at least like for them, they want to change, you know, like how they want to engage. You know, they have been actively part, part of the protest. They have been actively part of trying to make things happen, but they feel hopeless. They feel, you know, kind of um, not empowered enough like to do things. But is it in the government interest to create, you know, people who are not necessarily like, you know, challenged to them. Yes, that has been the case. David, if you want to say something. Uh, why don't we let, uh, no, I'll, I'll come. Okay, sir. Thanks for that. Hello. <clears throat> um, Hey, um, I missed your name, but I loved your presentation. It was really, really excellent and thought provoking. Um, and I wanted to kind of, offer some reassurance and maybe a little hope. <laughs> um, 
So the reassurance um, is about this kind of the increasing commodification of education, right? And this is something that you actually see very readily in the UK. So I taught for many years in FE colleges and year after year, there was kind of a lot of pressure on the lecturers to move people forward. There were more and more people in the classrooms you had from, we started with 25, then it moved to 40, then 60. In fact, I had one student who I believe was technically homeless, right? And the incentive from the perspective of the college was financial, right? So you have even here in these kind of like Western, most developed countries, you have this um, flip from education as a transformational opportunity to educational as a transactional uh, state of affairs. So what you're describing in Ethiopia, the, the reassurance is that you have it here too, perhaps not as, as readily or as big, but there is a continuum. And I, I would hate the picture to be, this is something that only happens in Ethiopia, but here in the West, you know, we don't commodify education. We don't, um, you know, think of education as a transaction where we're trying to move people along. So that's the reassurance. We're on a continuum, right? It's not like Ethiopia's bad and, you know, we in the West, we're fantastic. It's not true. Um, but the second thing that I wanted to leave with was um, what to kind of talk to you about is something that in your presentation that gave me a bit of hope. And there were two things in particular that gave me hope. And the first is that these teachers that you're talking about, some of these teachers who actually really believed in that power of education, the transformational power of education, they were focusing on those one or two students in their classes who could um, have many of those three dimensions that you were talking about, right? So those teachers, those, those agents on the ground, and the second thing that gave me hope is kind of the, the digital um, part where you, you mentioned a girl who said, um, I can find the information that I need on the internet, right? You've got digital resources, of course, in, in villages, digital exclusion and digital poverty may be an issue, but you do have the opportunity, right, through the internet to find and discover much of this information. So, the hope comes from looking at informal contexts outside of the fear of the formal constructs that you have for education what is happening in the informal world that is really kind of feeding those three elements or elements parts of those three elements that that you discussed so where, where is the hope here and there, there appears to be some yeah thank you thank you thank you mm. uh, Couple of um, there are a couple of questions in the chat, um, and I'll speak them out so that we can the recording captures them, and perhaps you can then speak to them. So um, Rosemary um, says, after describing the state of education in Ethiopia with all the barriers raised, what is the contribution? New knowledge your study is bringing forward for policymakers, government, etc. Um, so, at least, well, this is particularly for policymakers, not academics. So, I'll just answer it to that. Um, so, I would say. Um, Mostly, it's the understanding that you know the conflict, especially for Ethiopia's conflict, it would be very has been undermined to the level of like you know the ethnicity, like you know the ethnic conflict. Much of the drive for like you know the individual participants has been the feeling of there isn't a prospect or there isn't a future for them, and that has been you know as soon as one feels that it's been like a factor where they can be easily mobilized or you can say, okay, I can participate in this conflict if it's going to win for me. So my special contribution for the policymakers, especially because it's concerned on Ethiopia, would be, you know, really appreciating that aspect of, you know, what's driving this conflict, though, again, it is like, you know, the ethnic entrepreneurship is the hopelessness aspect. And we have to ask at the level of education how it is, you know, giving 
the students like you know the potential to do this and then the second like the second aspect is simply for me maybe it's um, popular i'm still a student i'm learning what are the other means but for me the idea that we should educate everybody at least through formal schooling in the way it has been done it doesn't work for us it's an agricultural society that like it should have taken step by step to adopt you know it's like but it did, you know, like if you have a growing 110 million people, you know, to educate everybody, like to give universal education through schooling, we just lost much of like, you know, our technical skills, our vocational skills at the cost of that. And people feeling like they can't go back and do agriculture now because they have gotten modern education. So for me, like the policymakers is you can't go and say everybody needs education. That's the way to go. Like, I don't think everybody needs education, at least with the way it has been formalized through like you know a formal schooling there are other ways of education the church education the informal education that could have been adopted versus you know it wasn't done so the expansion of education in ethiopia at least the way it has been done uh, I, I think it didn't serve us like as well as it should have been so that's the policy I think. yeah thank you thank you um questions are coming thick and fast now um so i'd like to read emily's question from the chat which says um, there are similarities with the Kenyan context, but it seems the Ethiopian context is on the extreme end of the barriers to flourishing. Has this been the case through all the years of Ethiopia's existence, or was there a time that there were pathways to flourishing when education was doing good? How can this be reversed? Revolution. Yeah, yeah. Um, like I, I don't know how to make it. It, it. Basically, Ethiopia, because it was never colonized, it's very interesting to understand the history of modern education. The first modern education came in 1908, so that's very late compared to much of like the other African countries. Yeah. So from 1908 up to almost 1974, only three percent of the education was educated, and at that time of the education, actually, it did bring flourishing, but to a very selected few who got like, you know, at the level of like, you know, really like, you know, the university students at that level of in Ethiopia could actually advocate and write and like argue at the level of, you know, you know, universities in the US or something. People wanted to stay in universities in Ethiopia. And in fact, you go outside when you didn't get accepted to the university in Ethiopia, to the Haile Selassie University. So fast forward, 1974, communism happens. And it says, you know, it's like we want to make sure, you know, this education is accessible for everybody. So we adopted communist strategy. Yeah. Then what happened was, so that few, but very good education was distributed to everybody, but with average education. And then from communism, that was like a very few percent. When 1991 federalism happened and we needed a way to actually have, you know, a multi-ethnic group. We basically and at the co like, you know, with the force of Millennium Development Goal, again, we were basically forced to make sure I say this because Ethiopian modern education did not have time to naturally, I say naturally, was called evolve over the course of centuries, like other education systems that had. So from 1991, from less than whatever, 10 percent, 15 percent, I don't have the exact numbers. We were basically needing to expand and have universal education for everybody. So we're currently facing this thing, which is, again, unlike Kenya or unlike other countries, you know, um, we did need to expand and we didn't adopt our own educational philosophy. Um, so, but I don't know what the rest of the question was, but was there a time where there was education flourishing? Absolutely, yes. But for the few, that's one. And during, before modern education, during the time of the church education, absolutely, yes. Ethiopia has, you know, like the, it's orthodox religion, it's, you know, much of the tradition, but that has been within the church more than like, you know, this like um, the modern education phenomena that we are uh, explaining. But we demolished that or we needed to demolish that when we transferred into modern education. And that was a mistake that at least we did. Wonderful. Thank you. So we've got one question from the floor and then Katie, it will be your turn for a question. Um, Um, yeah, thank you for your talk. I thought it was very interesting um, to hear your perspective on education and also sort of how the conflict has like contributed to 
the state that it's in now. Um, my question for you is to do with like federalism and whether you think that I mean, try not to be like too political, but whether a centralized the benefits of a centralized or do you think the benefits of a centralized system would outweigh those of a federalized system? Because I think the whole idea of um, well, that, the implementation of federalism in Ethiopia, which occurred like in the 1990s, I think, um, may have been like created with the wrong intentions when in fact it probably had the potential to do good. Um, with the country being so diverse, with in terms of like the languages spoken and the cultures um, in the country, we may actually benefit from like communities having their own established educations and um, I'm coming from the perspective of, of a psychologist, so um, there's like evidence to show that, you know, for example, kids not being assessed in their primary native language because the dominant language in the country is Amharic, but when kids go home, they're speaking like other different languages and the discrepancy between those two can affect performance. Um, and this whole idea about just like ethnic conflicts as well um, has, I think, even though it's, it's quite... Um, in the news, it's become a big thing, but it's how it's been portrayed in the past. A lot has been affected by how like colonizers or um, like the Italians wrote about um, the history as well. Um, so, yeah, in summary, do you think federalism has the potential to do good? Um, this is a very uh, important question for the context of Ethiopia, um, because how do you to basically how do you make sure there is equity of education when you have 80 ethnic groups, like you know, within language? So let alone Ethiopia was 80 ethnic groups. You know, the U.S. was one language of the, you know English, or at least for now, like the U.K. like you know was English. They're still struggling with what, that, what, that, what does it mean to teach a multi plural society. So for Ethiopia, I absolutely say, yeah, we needed federalism, especially then that was the only way we can integrate us. We needed federalism. And I say, even now, we need that actually to make sure people feel fairly treated for everybody to use their own primary language. Yeah? But we needed to acknowledge that and do a remedy to it. So when I, you speak to a student, what you say is like, when, there has never, so they say, well, how come we didn't, you know, like lead summer trips to go to another ethnic group or to another region to meet, you know, like these people that would have made it like it would have made the civics education or the history education more relevant to us had we met in person? Or how come we, like the language was given within the different, like, you know, regions? Now, because again, like, because the, this common identity, like the federalism as a structure could have been kept, but at the same time, we could have given ways in which people could interact with one another, ways people could feel they are in this together. There's a commonality where it could bind them. Well, like, in, I can't go much further, but like, the, it's the opposite that happened. But at the very minimum, there could have been a way in which people could communicate. You are having university students where people cannot speak, like, supposedly we should use English, but people are not adequately English, English speaking. So people at a university where they can't speak to each other in one country, yeah? Had we been, for example, if there was colonization, maybe you could have used this, like, you know, French or something. But in Ethiopia, this didn't happen. So once we adopted federalism, we could have gone further and said, okay, yes, we need to use this, like, as a means of, like, you know, structuring it. But education could also be used to actually share cultures with one another. Share. I didn't, I could have learned something about the other. I didn't learn during my time. I could have gone on trips. I didn't do that. So... My, my, my things that were omitted that could have been there and that were not done, than the system, the federalism itself, because that's the option, the, the only option we had at the time. And in fact, we also have at the time now. Um, yeah. Thank you for such a rich answer. Um, now I'm going to pass the baton over to Katie Annis, who has written a long question and comment in the chat, which you can perhaps use to kind of ground your responses. but. Katie, it'd be great to hear from you um, um, if you'd like to share. Sure, sure. I did put it in the chat. I forgot I had my hand raised as well, so I'll, <laughs> I'll offer the verbal question. 
So you've done a great uh, expose of really the forces of disintegration, the things that have brought down um, Ethiopian education over the last decades. And when we think about human flourishing globally, there are a lot of barriers. I think there would be maybe 90% barriers to human flourishing. We see a huge process of disintegration, destruction globally. Um, and you know what you've talked about is something that's happened over a couple decades. You know, with a with a heavy hand of you know party rule, and with a system with 35 million students in the education system. You know, it's the second most populous nation in Africa. So that's a lot of people who've been affected by the processes that you have talked about. Um, but I just wanted to ask you, or maybe challenge you, if you could do a follow up study um, to this work that you've done on what are the counter forces to that? You know, on the other hand, you see um, various individuals or small organizations or small, you know, bright lights of people who, you know, either have a vision of how things in Ethiopia were different than they are now, or who say, you know, this generation has lost something. What is it that they have lost? And they, they see a value that Ethiopia has. And you know, I even know of people who've spoken of sending, you know, pioneers from Ethiopia to other places on the continent or to the U.S. You know, the, the social skills, the way of sharing, of giving, of interacting, of, of selflessness, of cooperation might be more highly advanced in the Ethiopian context than in other contexts. And there, you know, I think in the, when a, not this Minister of Education, but in a previous minister, they did a, a study and found that I don't know how they did the scale of study, but 100,000 parents um, uh, identified moral education and character as uh, one of the core needs that was lacking in education. Um, and some initial efforts were put forward to respond to that, but of course, everything has ground to a halt with conflict. But there are these points of light. Um, and I don't really um, expect you to kind of address this right now because you've done a whole presentation on the other side. The, the destructive forces um, that would counter human flourishing. Um, but I would ask you, if you were going to do another report, how could you systematically um, sort of bring to light and do a report on what are the, um, the constructive forces that, that are enabling avenues and pathways toward human flourishing? Um, because Ethiopia is, it, you know, has an, an extraordinary potential on this side, maybe even greater than some other nations. And so I wonder if it, it, would, it would warrant, um, you know, something that looks at both angles. Sure. Um, so I will, I, will, I will answer it because obviously the focus has been the formal education itself for this case, but what are the counter forces? Uh, or, you know, what, what, I, what could have I talked about like to see when the flourishing has happened? If I had a different uh, dissertation, I would actually have studied about the liturgy of the church. In Ethiopia, I went and asked, you know, it's like, that the thing is, oh, they didn't learn about moral education, they didn't learn about civics, you know, it's like, and I went to the curriculum and I saw there was nothing about peace. And I, hence I concluded, this student or generation didn't learn about peace. But then I went and asked and said, do you think they don't know about peace? In Ethiopia, the church, Every day, I mean, the, like I can't, talk, I can't speak for the most, but I know at least the experience of the church. Every day holds a liturgy, and its liturgy, it prays for peace, it teaches for peace, and people are actually are more attracted and they listen to the church history or to the church teaching, because again, traditionally also that's where education came from. The church education came from the Ethiopian Orthodox Church, I mean, in this case. And it's whole, like several of the teachings, several of like the culture are associated to, to these things. When much of the conflicts happened for the past 30 years, the government appealed to the community elders where it's called Shimgelena. It's a system in which there are elders and they go through elders to actually make peace. And this is not just within one ethnic group. There are several differently studied means of like, you know, this peace conflict resolution within the different ethnic groups. And for me, that's where the flourishing happened, but at a very small scale that could and should have been scaled. In fact, at the expense of modern education, if I was to um, uh, resource allocate, but the, 
most people say, you know, Ethiopia could actually become the next Soviet Union or the Yugoslavia. It won't be, and it is not at the moment. And in fact, this is mostly has to do with, you know, when you are hungry, when you don't have much, when you are being oppressed and stuff, what's actually keeping you from going and killing everybody? And for me, that has been much of it. People tell you the amount of resilience they have learned and developed through their own sense of understanding of what they say, God, or the church education, what they say, because it is transpired in much of like many other things. So if I was to go back and actually see the assets for human flourishing, I would actually focus on specific cultural practices that has happened for the past and that continue to be there, but they were not scaled, they were not given, uh, you know, um, attention by the government. So that, those are where assets are. And those were the counter forces that actually why Ethiopia didn't go for, you know, much of like a civil war that um, for the past few years, but now we are experiencing. So um, I would say, yes, assets for those. But in terms of about the NGOs, actually, I would say this fact. There was a law actually anti the NGOs where the government said, if you are funded internationally, you can't actually run anything related that has to do peace building or anything related to history or politics or like working with government. So this was a law until like very recently when Abi came. So much of the NGO space within this frameworks have been limited. So the assets lies within the local culture. Uh, but with that, again, it's like since like, you know, what, what is to be done, what must be done or what my role should be, I would say for me actually moving forward again, like at least with this PhD, maybe later on, I will learn something else. I've become very much like, you know, questioning of what is the purpose of like the schooling as we know it? How else could I have done it if it was me? And that for me has meant I would focus on this indigenous aspects or indigenous cultural practices where it is happening, flourishing is happening, but not necessarily, you know, research or seen by much of the formal education system. So that's that I say flourishing is happening. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Thank you. Um, Katie, would you like to come back on that? Um, or uh, there's another question from the floor, which we could have. Okay. Um, okay, we could you. Um, so I was actually, I was quite interested in how you see. I was, I was going to ask you what do you think are um, other alternative forms of edu providing education in some ways, alternative forms of knowledge that could be cultivated as education. But given your emphasis on church and, and the relig religiosity that informs um, education, I was kind of wondering, there, there clearly is a clash between um, a socialist slash secular conception of education, which in some contexts may be enforced top down. And then the uh, perhaps a non-socialist but religious approach to values that one also finds in secular understandings uh, or through education. So I was wondering if, if you consider um, church as an alternative school where same values can be taught and perhaps in better way it, at some level level it, it kind of demands an ideological shift between that secular understanding of education and that um, religious and gaining of those values so what are some of the pathways that can or, or bridge that can make this ideological shift happen because I like the reason why I ask this is because this is very dated, but I I read something a while ago um, about how uh, the socialist state in India failed because it just was not in touch with the religious reality of the people. So, and I was kind of, I guess, in your comment, I I sort of noticed a similar clash, and I was wondering if you could speak a little about how we can bridge this. Um, sorry. So I would, I would, um, I would say that yes. Again, for example, that, that similarly, yes, that, that 
this is flourishing, especially for the context of morals, characters, virtues, and what's most needed, for example, if you ask what is education for in the Ethiopia's context, better the betterment of the agriculture and having a harmonious society. That's what we're struggling with, still a backward agriculture and a harmonious society. So for harmonious society or peaceful society, you know, you need the idea of, again, a flourished understanding of like virtue characters and stuff. And that's why I say the church education, perhaps the church education would not teach architecture, but the, like, the moral teaching comes. And then for the ideological shift that you say, like this secular understanding within Ethiopia, many other countries and for many, it's you know, this morals and characters, our understanding of like, you know, this educations came from the church. It came from our religious understanding of what it means to be moral and stuff. But we quickly jumped to say, we need to have a secular civics education. And Ethiopia made mistakes like most others. So what, what happened was in, before then, uh, we call it Gibragab education in Ethiopia, like or character education. And it's given by the priests within the schools. 1974, when the revolution happened, the communist government said to hell with this and completely adopted communist ideology, the worker. So we just said completely secular and there was a mismatch. From then we went into 1991, where it was basically about like, you know, a, a, a citizen of the federalist system. So there are multi-ethnic groups, you should have tolerance. But as someone told me tolerance, but not necessarily you. So what happened again, what I would say is it's like, Yes, there is an ideological need. What would I do to bridge it? First is the acceptance that, look, the church education, we can debate on how we can make it less and less militarized or at least more and more acceptable to other religions because we have many phases, but we cannot negate the fact that our understanding of morals, ethics, all these things historically came from this institution and that some societies actually rely to this institution, to the church institution, to actually equip them with these things more than the schooling system, the secular schooling system. For Ethiopia, the first bridge for me is accepting that and actually finding means and ways to actually for students to bridge the gap and sit in and actually help. And because they will less, listen more to actually the press than this teacher that they think is unqualified. So the acceptance will be the first test. And then more, like after that, how do we design it? How do we make it less militarized, more acceptable to other religions? I hope there is like a bunch of research showing this. I'm not fully qualified, but maybe that would be my work. Thank you. Well, that was a great question. I will be interesting article. And um, David, I don't know, do you want to uh have some final thoughts before we close sure. this and yet another fascinating yeah, seminar. Absolutely. Thanks very much, uh, Adam, and thanks for the uh, very many questions. I think they were all very thought provoking as as was your talk. Um, I mean, you know, where does where does it start? I, I, um, I suppose I get the sense that, you know, the discussion between um, or, you know, um, whether we talk about formal education or church education and which of those two uh, types of education perhaps is uh, the, um, the better bet on promoting uh, human flourishing. I think there's also a tension in a lot of the questions I think that have come from the floor almost in a sense that the, uh, the state ultimately where it is you know, communist, communist X or, you know, uh, rural India or Ethiopia, that the state ultimately is the uh, essential uh, benefactor that is unchallenged. I mean, I was, I was struck in last, last year's seminar, we had a, a student from Palestine who, uh, you know, was really quite clear that uh, Education is a site for struggle. Uh, it is not about um, some kind of ordained purpose. It is where, when bombs were uh, were, were were fired on uh, camps in Shabra and so on uh, by the Israelis, that Palestinians went underground into underground schools. They came together, and for them, it wasn't a sense of, of hopelessness because they wouldn't achieve the sort of instrumental outcomes of education. It wasn't an issue that they wouldn't become engineers or pilots or doctors. 
uh, necessarily immediately. Their quest was to flourish as a nation through a resistance to oppression. And for them, education became a site of struggle. And questions such as cynicism, Kurt's point, or hopelessness, a wonderful uh, sort of concept uh, that I think uh, Adam has uh, helped us to, um, uh, to try and focus on, uh, all became part of a tool bag uh, to achieve flourishing. These were not hopeless things. These are not uh, uh, things to be dismissed. Cynicism is an important piece of the armory to achieving flourishing. That is, in a sense, bizarrely, hopelessness, etc. If one uh, uh, takes the Palestinian example of education, really, as a, as a, as a site of struggle, and that ultimately, when they go to school, wherever they are, uh, and it's easy enough to be dismissive of them not having teachers skilled enough to uh, engage them in critical debate, and that may well be right to allow them to become critical thinkers, and that may well be, be right. But I think yeah. the other perspective is simply that where people come together in social activity, wherever that is, and even in very poor schools, etc., the opportunity uh, for uh, critical awareness, the opportunity for understanding each other. So, you know, when Adam said, is there a book to go to? And I thought, well, actually, throughout my career, there were probably many. Could I now... Uh, direct mm -hmm. from the is a very uh, perceptive sort of question. Mm -hmm. I probably struggle a little bit. So, well, in your case, Adam, why don't you look at Jacques Delors, who was a French prime minister, and his book on uh, you know uh, the four sort of pillars of education and learning to live together, and so on and so on. Or why don't you turn to Dewey, who spoke of democracy, and that was the purpose. But ultimately, you know, globalization has meant that for many governments, including Ethiopia and wherever they are, ultimately flourish has been um, foregrounded almost as an ideal to be achieved in alignment with financial prosperity. So for every government everywhere, the drive, as I think uh, Ukusu Kusha was, uh, was uh, saying tonight, the drive is um, for uh, some kind of uh, qualification, some, some huge amount of effort is by, by, by governments. Not because ultimately the belief is that individual mm -hmm. human beings flourish. Ultimately the belief is that if one can show volume, in other words, 80% of a population, wherever they are, achieves educational attainment, i.e. first degrees or master's degrees, etc. The economics tell us that the return to uh, national income, but also household income or individual income, is sharp and it rises. And that's what a country counts as part of its, you know, its GDP is, is prospective. And then, of course, the, the kind of new right discourse that has overtaken us is where countries are reasonably wealthy, then benefits trickle down to the, to the poor. So many countries will drive their educational systems in this way and look at flourishing through this particular through this uh, particular uh, lens. Others would argue that actually really the main purpose of education and the purpose is to get human beings to get in touch with themselves, to be emotionally settled and altogether sort of pleasant and reasonable people and that uh, educational systems should be geared towards achieving uh, that. But there are very few countries that would make that ultimately and practically and operationally the main driver of education, although they would acknowledge it. But for most, it is achieving a kind of economic um, prosperity. 
ultimately, yeah. I think, you know, Adam is a, a huge uh, series of questions that I think are applicable in so many, uh, you know, mm. different uh, societies. There are many, many graduates, including in the USA, in the UK, who feel a sense of hopelessness because, um, you know, uh, it's even a master's degree, very competitive to get a job flipping burgers, as the Americans would call it in, uh, in, in McDonald's. So there's no sort of certainty of, of any sort of uh, uh, ideal, um, ideal uh, job. Uh, there's clearly a sense of cynicism uh, and that exists uh, and that touches us in so many uh, in so many different ways. And ultimately, I think, uh, you know, I'm sort of minded to think that uh, the Palestinian student we had was probably right in her uh, rather bold, some for, for, for many sort of almost uh, aggressive uh, that really uh, uh, you know, achieving, flourishing, uh, the pathways to it where necessary is through conflict. So education's role isn't necessarily to subdue conflict, but actually to provoke it. Because if it isn't, then the ability to think critically to, uh, to get together and work out what the problems are so that we can achieve it um, becomes less. And I think one would find that if we turn to Stephen Bantubika, Black Consciousness uh, medic in South Africa in 1976, about how do you weaponize education? Now, this is clearly what you don't want to be doing at DPhil in peace building. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but they are provocative thoughts, and I think they come from a very provocative presentation. And thank you very much, Adam. It's a fantastic delight. Thank you. <laughs> well, yeah, thank you very much again. And um, thank you all for joining for our most stimulating um, talk and seminar. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay.